everyone. Bringing you another LSAT logic game setup laid out for you. Uh, this is Clay from Claiborne Education. I'm, I'm the LSAT director at Claiborne. And we have found over many years that our approach to logic games is, is really revolutionary for students. It transforms that the way that they approach the section. So really looking forward to showing you that here. This is from prep test number 10 and the first game respecting LSAT's copyright. I'm not gonna be reading out all of the text, so you'll need to have it in front of you. But let's go ahead and think what we have before us. First, let me just note, we've got prep test 10, game number one, and we have essentially an in-out game here, right? You might recognize it as, a, as an in-out grouping kind of game as you read it over, if you have some familiarity with LSAT logic games. And when we say in out, we don't technically mean in this case that one is the in group and one is the out group. No, in fact, one of them is the appetizer and the other a main dish. But an LSAT logic game qualifies as an in out grouping game when each of the players or elements can only be in one of the groups or the other. So there's this kind of exclusivity to it. If you're not in one group, you're in the other. And if you are in one group, you're not in the other. So we have an appetizer group, we have a main dish group, and then we have the seven elements, the players that we're dealing with here. Now in any kind of grouping game, we always wanna pay attention right away to any numerical specificity, meaning do we know how many are in each group? Well, in this case, we don't get that exactly. We don't know how many uh, seasonings uh, or flavorings are in each group, but we do know that the appetizer can only have three flavorings at the most. So forgive the mathematical symbol there. If math terrifies you, um, you can use the different symbol, no more than three. At most three of the flavorings are in the appetizer. Well, now think about that for a moment. Let's not just write that, but let's, let's draw the inference that follows from that. If there are seven flavorings and the appetizer can have three at most, then the main dish would have to have four at least. It's always good to go ahead and write your spaces on a grouping game if you can guarantee that something has to go in that space. I never write a space if I don't have a guarantee that I have to fill that space. But we know we're gonna need to fill four main dish spaces. The appetizer, the game implies, will have at least one flavoring and this is as far as we can go, at least one in the appetizer, at least four in the main dish, which leaves two kind of wild card spaces that we don't know about yet. But we get something unusual for an in-out game. You don't often get a block in an in-out game. So when you do, you wanna capitalize it on it to all that it's worth. Suck all the marrow out of that block, as Thoreau said. Wasn't he talking about LSAT logic games when he said that? We have a great opportunity here with a block on an in-out game because it's going to really simplify the action to a very high yield situation where we learn a whole lot. And what I'm referring to is the GN block in the last rule. If we know that they're together, then let's just posit that they are. In other words, don't just write it out to the side as a block. The whole point of the decision tree method for generating these advanced game boards is to do the work in advance, that is, play out the possibilities. See what actually happens. Don't be afraid to dive in there. As we like to say, stop staring, start scribbling. Get in there, get your hands dirty. Let's put GN in the appetizer and see what that means. Well, we know it means that the F must be in the main dish because it cannot be with the N. We then know one more thing, and this is a super helpful rule for an in-out game. We have an anti-block rule, two elements that can't be together, S and T. I'm actually gonna erase where I put F and put S and T in a place where I can easily draw a handle. I know that always, no matter what, one of them is in the appetizer, the other's in the main dish, they can't be together, but notice what happened in this case. Not only do we know that F is here, but that main dish has to have everybody else because the appetizer has already reached its maximum. So our floaters here 
are free agents that we don't know anything about, which in this case are going to be L and what do we got? P, they have to fill the main dish in this case. We have to have four flavorings at least in the main dish and there we go. If we put GN in the A column, we know almost everything that happens. All right, I'm gonna once again draw out four minimum spaces there, one here. We already exhausted the possibilities for GN in the A column. So let's put it in the M column and see what happens. Well, that does force F over here. Sorry, going to erase again. Sometimes, you know, you start to draw and then you wanna just rearrange things so that they're a little bit more conveniently located. Let's put GN on this far other end. I just wanna leave room for the ST thing to happen again. One in one spot and one in the other. Now here you see the advantage of drawing out the spaces in advance that we know we have to fill. Filling out game board number two this way shows us that, hey, we still have a place to fill. We, we have to put something in this spot. And the only players left are the, the free agents, the, the floaters, L and P. We don't normally know where they go, but in this case, one of them has to go here. And I'm just gonna say LP like that. But be careful, be very careful here. This does not imply that the other one of LP has to go over here because remember the appetizer already has a flavoring. It has two in fact, it's okay. It has to have a maximum of three but there's the minimum is really just the one flavoring. So we don't have to put the other one of LP over here. It could actually be a fifth element present in the end column. If you'd like, you can kind of put LP, you know, somewhere near the, the center. Actually, I'm gonna make it P slash L um, to indicate it's the other one of the LP pairing. L slash P is, is one, P slash L is the other. And just give yourself some arrows, just to remind yourself the last remaining player in this case could go in either group. And here's the cool thing. This is how high yield this game is. We don't need any more examples. We put the GN block in A and had the exhaustive results. We put the GN block in M and, and still have the exhaustive results. We don't need to play out any more possibilities because there aren't any more. This is the ultimate in a high yield game where you only have two game boards and you basically know everything that can happen. You just need to resolve the ST and where the LP go in L and P go in this situation. There's very little that is unknown at this point and nothing that can stump you as you go into the questions. So this is a wonderfully high yield game where it's absolutely worthwhile. You might even say mandatory to do these diagrams, these game boards in advance. You're in so much better shape going into the questions than you would be otherwise. So go ahead and check out other Logic Games videos that we have where we show you this powerful decision tree method for the setup that makes doing the questions so much easier. And come talk to us if you'd like to talk more about the LSAT.